Welcome to Dr. Fossum's Pet Care Webinar Series. So the topic for today is going to be canine cognitive dysfunction, or CCD, and we're focusing on therapeutic options. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the pathophysiology, but I'm going to focus on the different treatment options, and I'm also going to um, talk about a new integrative supplement that is a combination of what's considered more conventional nutraceuticals and some Chinese herbals. And it is a new product um, uh, from Dr. Fossum's Pet Care. So my name is Dr. Curtis Dewey. Uh, I am a um, integrative veterinarian, also a neurologist and surgeon. And um, I'm gonna give you um, a lot of the information out there that we know about CCD and also some of my perspective on the disease. So as um, the goals of this presentation, just kind of an overview of pathophysiology and clinical features of canine cognitive dysfunction. Um, I'm gonna go through a bunch of different treatment options that are out there. Um, pause a little bit to talk about why you might choose one or, or another or a combination. If you do have some more general questions about canine cognitive dysfunction, there are um, a lot of different resources. Um, I published a review article in Vet Clinics of North America uh, in 2019 uh, with some of my colleagues. So it's a pretty good overview of canine cognitive, cognitive dysfunction, um, pathophysiology, different treatment options, et cetera. Here are some common misconceptions re regarding canine cognitive dysfunction. Uh, one is that it's not common. It's, it's very common. Um, the other is it's normal for dogs to become senile. And that's often an owner perspective that, well, you know, they're getting old, so it's probably normal for them to get lost or have accidents in the house, that sort of thing. And the last one is that there are no effective treatment options. In other words, there's nothing you can do. And of course, as we'll discuss further, there's a lot you can do. And, and a lot of the treatment options are, are actually effective. So uh, how is this canine cognitive dysfunction or CCD, is, how is it similar to Alzheimer's disease? Very similar. Uh, is very similar um, pathophysiologically. It's very um, similar in what uh, how things progress. Um, one thing that not quite as similar is that dogs with this their their version of Alzheimer's CCD they don't tend to get quite as um, affected as people do. They don't tend to get pharyngeal laryngeal dysfunction and pneumonia. Um, so there, there is evidence that, um, you know, a lot of these dogs, they're usually fairly old when this disease starts. Uh, and there's evidence that they, although they, it is a progressive disease, it's not curable, they, they respond well enough that their overall lifespan is not appreciably different than older dogs who do not have CCD. So one of the things, of course, that you want to dispel is that when an older dog comes to a veterinarian, um, sometimes the owners are like, well, there's nothing you can do. Well, that's not true. There are things you can do and they actually often work. Uh, slows things down, gives them more time to be a happy pet. So it affects the elderly, um, gradual onset of dementia. The structural brain changes were to those. Um, they do get generalized brain atrophy, but so do normal older dogs. Specifically dogs, similar to people, they'll get hippocampal atrophy. Um, they also get atrophy of their inner thalamic adhesion, which you can easily measure that on an MRI image if that's chosen as a diagno diagnostic tool. Similar to people with Alzheimer's disease, there's pathologic deposition of beta amyloid and tau protein in dogs' brains with cognitive, cognitive dysfunction. Um, the, we'll talk a little bit, a little bit later in the presentation of uh, what is what is beta amyloid. What is it? Um, everyone knows it's bad. Uh, it's sort of toxic in and of itself. But how does it get there? And what's what's the, uh, the um, stimulus for that to arrive in the brain? Tau protein is another one. It's a little bit more mysterious. It doesn't seem to form tangles that much in dogs like it does in people. Um, and linked to beta amyloid. Um, is uh, microvascular changes or you know you know vascular disease in brain parenchyma? Um, how does this unfold? 
what comes first. Uh, a lot of information would suggest that, that vascular change precedes beta amyloid deposition, but, um, but it's not that simple. We'll talk about another wrinkle in this story a little bit later. It does sort of tie into some of the, um, some of the dietary things that we're, we'll discuss. So how common is this? Um, if you look at this slide, it's, like it's pretty common, and it is. Um, it's probably actually more common than it's in the literature because uh, to some extent, um, owners of elderly dogs uh, assume that some of these signs might just be normal aging, just getting a little bit forgetful. And of course, it's, it's most likely not. It's probably just early onset of dementia. So probably higher than these numbers would suggest, but in general, somewhere between 14 and 30 percent. 5% of the pet dog population overall. As they get older, of course, these numbers go up. So when dogs are 11 and 12 years old, 28%. If they get to be 15 or 16, 68%. And um, you've probably noticed that your, your um, uh, patients in general, the percentage of older dogs is going up. They're, they're living longer, uh, which is great. But the other thing we have to keep track of is a lot of these geriatric type disorders are also, you're, you're seeing more of them. And this is, this is one of them. There's one interesting paper that showed uh, a long, it was a longitudinal study that showed that some of these older dogs that were considered um, cognitively normal, um, about, you know, about a third of them progressed to mild impairment. And the ones that are considered mildly impaired, 22% um, moved into the category of more obvious CCD or, or dysfunction. So this is um, a little bit scary, all these little things, the pathophysiology, but we'll go through them. Um, it's, it's not just sort of like a bunch of stuff that's not interrelated, they are interrelated. So I mentioned a little bit in one of the other slides that cerebral vascular disease is related to um, deposition of toxic beta amyloid in the brain. And of course, both of these are related to oxidative brain damage. Um, and some of these also affect um, mitochondrial function, which has uh, been shown to be poor in uh, dogs and people with cognitive impairment, excitotoxic or glutamate mediated brain damage, impaired neuronal glucose metabolism. That we'll talk about a little bit later on um, when the Alzheimer's or CCD brain is having trouble utilizing its main source of energy, glucose, there is an alternative and that would be ketones. Uh, ketones are um, often derived in some of these formulations, dietary formulations, or as just a supplement, uh, um, medium chain triglycerides, and this should be having sort of a, uh, just a general positive effect on neural function. MCTs are rapidly converted to ketones, which can be used by the um, disease brain for an alternative uh, energy source. So we just covered the conventional pathophysiology of canine cognitive dysfunction slash Alzheimer's disease. And because we're going to talk about a supplement later on, and about half of it is Chinese herbals, um, it's probably a good idea to go over some of the comparisons of how things are looked at with Alzheimer's or CCD from a TCVM or traditional Chinese veterinary medicine outlook. Um, so when you look at CCD from a conventional standpoint, uh, some very um, important features stand out are accumulation of toxic amyloid or beta amyloid in the brain, vascular pathology, and dementia. When you look at it from a TCVM, traditional Chinese veterinary medicine standpoint, uh, phlegm the term phlegm in Chinese medicine refers to anything abnormal that shouldn't be there. Of course, that would go along with beta amyloid. Uh, blood and qi stagnation. Uh, well, blood's pretty obvious, it's blood. Uh, so clearly there's a, there's a uh, link there between the two um, types of pathophysiological, path pathophysiological description. Um, there are blood at blood abnormalities in Alzheimer's and CCD. Qi stagnation, qi refers to energy. And um, as we did mention a little bit, uh, the mitochondria, which are the energy powerhouse of the cell, are 
dysfunctional in Alzheimer's and canine cognitive dysfunction. Shen disturbance basically means there's something wrong with your cognition or your mentation. So again, another analog between um, sort of the metaphorical Chinese veterinary medicine terminology and what we consider conventional. So these two types of descriptions sound very similar because they are very similar. Um, although the um, ancient uh, Chinese, when they were working this stuff out, they didn't have the benefit of knowing anatomy physiology like we do. They, by observation, they came up with a system that mirrors what we know now to be true. For those of you who are, who are uh, knowledgeable about uh, traditional Chinese veterinary medicine, or those of you who would like to be, um, briefly going to go over the patterns, the TCVM, traditional Chinese veterinary medicine patterns for canine cognitive dysfunction. Um, if you look at um, all of these patterns, there's a couple of common themes. One is that there, a lot of them have yin deficiency. Uh, yin deficiency basically means sort of a, a hot or hot condition which often translates into just uh, anxiety and very difficult to calm down. And if you look at these, um, one, two, three, three of these four have yin deficiency. So it's a common theme. The other thing is uh, stagnation. Stagnation uh, often relates to pain, but blood stagnation would be, um, you know, some interference with, with, uh, with blood movement. And Another thing, these, these patterns are also linked to um, poor nutrition, another common theme. So spleen chi and heart chi deficiency, uh, the heart in TCBM is thought to, uh, they, they weren't completely accurate with their metaphors. The heart uh, is the seat of the mind. Uh, we, of course, know that's not true, but um, this is um, spleen chi and heart chi deficiency with phlegm missing the mind. That means that there's some sort of nutritional um, problem and something um, with the brain and phlegm is something abnormal that shouldn't be there, which would be in this case, uh, translatable to um, amyloid deposition. Heart yin and blood deficiency with chi blood stagnation. Again, another yin deficient state. Uh, kidney yin deficiency with Shen disturbance. Um, Kidney yin yang deficiency with Shen disturbance. This would be uh, more of a dog who's got uh, uh, more of a lack of energy uh, in addition to a uh, uh, yin deficiency. Part of yin deficiency too is described in, in TCVM um, parlance as uh, often um, just restless, especially you know in the evening, which is a very common thing that we see with dogs with with CCD. So this one, spleen, chi, and heart, chi deficiency, um, poor nutrition and chronic illness, um, progressively, progressively less responsive caretakers, shen disturbance basically means there's something wrong with your mentation. Um, these, a lot of these are very similar, pacing and wandering, aimlessly getting lost, sleeping more, pale, wet tongue, and uh, we won't get into the pulse thing, um, it's a little, little too much, but then again, with the spleen, uh, sort of the um, spleen refers primarily to the digestive system as a whole. So this would be a link between um, digestive disturbance and um, uh, cognitive impairment, which of course would fit with what we know now uh, with uh, some of the, the um, links uh, between the microbiome changing and having impairment of cognition. This heart yin and blood deficiency, some of these things are repeats. Uh, poor nutrition is also implicated insomnia, rest, rest anxiety, especially at night, um, sleeping more during the day, seeking cool areas, panting. And uh, again, we'll, we'll skip the tongue and the pulse stuff for, for now. The kidney is uh, thought of as the seat of the, the central nervous system uh, in TCVM. So again, another thing keeps coming up for nutrition, heart fire goes unchecked. Uh, and then that's more your mental state. Agitated pacing at night, panting, abnormal mentation or shen disturbance, drinking a lot, vocalizing, very, very 
you know, th things that are um, pretty translatable between, you know, TCVM and what we, um, we uh, see in conventional veterinary medicine. And, and this one, uh, again, not, not too many differences except for the cold bag um, and um, everything else is, is pretty much the same. So there are little variations on the theme. Um, so, and then if we break it down, sort of translating these different TCBM terms, cerebral vascular disease, chi, blood stagnation, infarcts, same thing. Micro hemorrhages, obviously blood. Um, occasional macro hemorrhages, same thing. And atrophy would be yin deficiency. Remember, anything where a structure gets smaller is a yin deficient state. Meningeal thickening, um, uh, something that shouldn't be there is phlegm. Ventricular dilation, that's because the brain's atrophied. Again, yin deficiency and uh, gliosis, which is sort of the brain's response to scarring, something that shouldn't be there would be uh, considered phlegm and TCVM metaphorical language. How do you diagnose canine cognitive dysfunction? Well, if um, MRIs were uh, not as expensive as they are and they didn't require general anesthesia, we would uh, ideally MRI all of them. That's not really realistic. So most of the time it's historical features, clinical signs. Uh, uh, if, if you can, it's great. A lot of people don't go for advanced imaging. Um, and of course, ruling out other causes of encephalopathy. There are some subtle things um, that not, not just the length of time, but some other characteristics of the dog with dementia that tend to discriminate them from having a brain tumor uh, that we can you know, talk about in some detail later. But um, of course, they're, um, part of it's the anxiety. It's very common for these dogs to be super anxious. So if you do MRI dog, um, with canine cognitive dysfunction, there are some things that are very similar to what's found in people with Alzheimer's disease. Generalized brain atrophy. Uh, one thing that seems to be very predictive in dogs, elderly dogs, to distinguish a normal aging or successful aging dog from one with dementia is that um, dogs with a canine cognitive dysfunction typically have an interthalamic adhesion that's five millimeters or less. Another thing is occasionally seen are these white matter hyperintensities right on the edge of the, uh, the appendum of the ventricles, and this is called leukoareosis. Um, and then the other thing, of course, are microhemorrhages that are found in the brains of a lot of um, people with Alzheimer's and also quite a few dogs with CCD. It's been shown in uh, human Alzheimer's disease that there's hippocampal atrophy, and that's also been shown in dogs with CCD. So we did a study looking at control age dogs, um, and dogs that had evidence of CCD, and we uh, biometrically measured their hippocampi um, and did find that there was a significantly smaller hippocampal volume in the dogs with canine cognitive dysfunction versus um, um, normal, you know, successfully, successfully aging dogs. Microhemorrhages in aging dogs, uh, same sort of thing. Um, we looked at this and found that. Um, 80% of dogs with canine cognitive dysfunction have microhemorrhages. Uh, there's another category of disease called, we think are similar to humans, cerebral amyloid angiopathy, where they have the hemorrhages without obvious dementia. Um, and of course, we looked at control dogs too, and about 12% of it had, had some microhemorrhages. And uh, this is thought to be due, in people is thought to be due to uh, beta amyloid deposition in blood vessel walls that causes them to be um, triable and they'll, they'll um, rupture. So there are a lot of features of CCD in dogs. These are the big four, the ones that come up most often. Uh, and probably one that causes a lot of consternation is anxiety. These dogs become very anxious, very frantic. Related to the anxiety, they often um, stay awake at night, um, often pacing around. Um, Owners often say they don't interact with, interact with them or other pets as much as they used to. And owners are often bring up, they think their dog seems confused or senile. To them. There's some other things that owners will sometimes bring up. And it's important to keep in mind 
that owners will will sometimes um, assess these historical observations um, rather than just relaying them to the veterinarian. They'll they'll try to give it a reason. And when you take a history, of course, it's important to ask things like, you know, is your dog not using the stairs anymore? Um, and these are, you know, yes or no questions. Um, but owners will sometimes say, well, you know, no, but I think it's because of the joint disease. And in many cases, the joint disease, if it's there, is not appreciable at all. Or, you know, I think, I think his eyesight or her eyesight is going. And we all know that dogs, they go completely blind unless they see a new environment. They memorize their house. So these, it's important when you get a history is try to um, get the, the just sort of the, the data of what's going on with the, with the patient uh, and, and, and you do the interpretation of what it means. Uh, because some of these things will be um, sort of given a different explanation by the owner. So how do you treat CCD? Um, not a lot of drugs um, have been shown to be effective. And of course, some of the cholinergic type drugs they use in people, they're not very popular in dogs. Um, they, they tend to have in people and probably, probably in dogs too, if we use them much, um, gastrointestinal adverse effects. There's a uh, several different dietary, um, commercial dietary uh, options for dogs with CCD. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. There's other things you can add to their diet, which would include a number of different nutraceuticals, um, things like medium chain triglycerides, omega-3 fatty acids, et cetera. And then there's other nutraceuticals in addition to those. Um, and there's some combination nutraceuticals. There's something called environmental enrichment. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Basically, you're stimulating their brain by providing them with different things, different things to sort of, you know, um, jumpstart them. Uh, herbal therapy, of course, we're going to cover uh, in a little bit of detail because um, we're going to talk about the Cognicaps uh, formulation, which is um, about half of what's in there are Chinese herbs. So, and there's some other things that um, fairly new developments that um, haven't been really investigated much in dogs, but they look pretty promising. So environment, environmental enrichment, what is that? So uh, you may have heard people say sometimes, well, you know, we only use a certain fraction of our brain at any one time. So what does that mean? It doesn't mean the rest of our brain's not really of any use. Uh, it means that it's, it's sort of potentially something of a backup system. And the theory of cognitive enrichment is if you stimulate the pet with different things, exercise, new situations, social interactions, new toys, et cetera, then you'll sort of stimulate those somewhat quiescent areas of the brain to take over the function of the damaged parts. Um, and it does seem to work. There's evidence that, that that kind of stimulation does improve cognition in people and dogs with cognitive impairment. So here's some other uh, potential therapies. These actually been looked into in, in rodent models of Alzheimer's as well as some um, uh, human studies. Uh, not looked into dogs yet, but they include uh, acupuncture, uh, including electroacupuncture, um, transcranial photobiomodulation, which is laser therapy. And there's several mechanisms, but that have been shown to be involved in that. One, of course, is that the um, uh, infrared, near, near uh, infrared, or near infrared light um, wavelengths are, um, there's a couple of them that are used commonly in laser therapy that are the right wavelengths to stimulate cytochrome C oxidase uh, in the mitochondria for the respiratory, respiratory chain and sort of um, improve mitochondrial function, which is often lacking in dementia. There's other things too. There's some um, um, promoting uh, growth promoting factors that are stimulated with laser therapy as well. But the, the mitochondrial theory is one of the top ones. Targeted pulse electromagnetic field therapy. What is that? That's um, uh, probably the most popular one is the CC loop that is used for pain management. They also make uh, another loop for um, anxiety, um, 
that's called a camera canine. So there is not as much evidence as with laser, but there's a little bit of evidence showing that, that TPEMF therapy can actually um, help improve cognition. So these are some other non-drug options. So here are some uh, mechanisms of action for positive effects seen with acupuncture. Again, a lot of this is from uh, people with Alzheimer's, studies in, in humans, and, so, and a lot of them are uh, uh, amyloid, uh, sorry, uh, um, rodent models of, of, of Alzheimer's. So one is uh, enhanced neuronal glucose utilization, uh, decreased accumulation of beta amyloid in the brain, increased production of neurotrophic factors, proliferation of neuronal stem cells, um, and protection or recovery from synaptic loss and dendritic atrophy in the hippocampus. Um, diet and dementia. So there's some overlap here with people and dogs as well. Um, it's not surprisingly, you know, uh, high intake of, intake of plant-based foods that have a lot of antioxidants in them, just taking antioxidants like omega-3s and that sort of thing, probiotics, certain grains, vegetables, nuts, uh, MCTs or medium chain triglycerides, and also fish. Um, so things that might not be a good idea if you want to avoid dementia, if you're a dog or a person, a lot of red meat or poultry. Poultry was a surprise to me when I found that out, but uh, refined sugar, processed food, and high fat dairy products. So again, a lot of this has been shown or suspected to be similar in dogs. So here's uh, four diets that are commercial diets for CCD. Um, and if you look at the ingredients of interest, you see that, um, that most of them have uh, MCT or medium chain triglycerides at a fairly high level. They have multiple things that are considered antioxidants also. So um, which one do you choose? Um, I would say, I mean, I think they're all four of them good products. The NeuroCare and the Hills BD have actually been tested in trials. I don't know if Bright Minds, I don't, I don't think Bright Minds or Rejuvenate have, but they're all for, um, you know, good quality commercial diet. So I mentioned before that this microvascular damage uh, beta amyloid link uh, is not as simple as people used to think. You know, the you know, the initial theories was beta amyloid is pivotal. Um, it's produced to some sort of abnormality in dogs or cat or dogs and, and people with, uh, you know, Alzheimer's, CCD. And then it was found that probably um, it's in response somehow to um, progressive microvascular damage. And they sort of feed on themselves. If you have vascular damage, it will promote beta amyloid deposition and beta amyloid can further damage blood vessels or this vicious circle. So here's the new, newer wrinkle. Um, there is overwhelming evidence that senescent changes to both the intestinal barrier, uh, intestinal blood barrier and the blood brain barrier in that order um, are associated with change in the gut microbiome. So as dogs, people get older, sometimes their gut microbiome switches to um, a fairly healthy population and one that maybe is not so healthy and that damages the um, intestinal barrier to the bloodstream. Toxins from the bacteria, from the, the sort of quote unquote bad bacteria, uh, enter the bloodstream, they make it to the brain, damage the blood-brain barrier and actually some bacteria make it there too. Um, they have actually found in um, um, recently autopsied human Alzheimer's patients, um, uh, porphyromonas porphyromonas um, bacteria, porphyromonas gingivalis bacteria, which is a bad actor in periodontal disease. We found it in the brain of some of these patients. So microbes and their to toxic products reach the brain after they damage the intestinal blood barrier and damage the blood brain barrier. And here's the sort of link here was where, how would all these things sort of be linked, uh, you know, sort of related to each other. 
beta amyloid is known to be a, a reactive protein. It's a reactive protein to microbial invasion or their, or their byproducts. So the gut brain axis dementia sort of story is that the microbiome breaks down as dogs or people age, the, they break through the intestinal barrier, they reach the brain to the bloodstream, um, damage the microvascular vasculature, and the, those products, those microbes, will stimulate beta amyloid as a reactive protein to the presence of those microbes or their byproducts. So, and of course, you wanna, we wanna note here that diet can be related to this too. So um, dietary manipulation can also be used to try to reverse this. And dietary manipulation includes things like those commercial diets, uh, nutraceuticals, um, probiotics, et cetera. And what we're talking about here is, is not simply just um, adding things that are antioxidants, but some of these diets and some of these, these um, nutraceuticals may actually change the microbiome back to what's more normal balance. So, and is there evidence that an altered microbiome is associated with dementia in dogs? Um, yes, just in general, when we do look into things that seem to be potential analogs between the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease and canine cognitive dysfunction, uh, we often find that it's very similar. So we did, a, it's a somewhat of a preliminary study. We looked at uh, older dogs, nine years plus, who have um, um, either, uh, you know, mild to severe periodontal disease. And uh, we basically had older dogs that did or did not have, according to the owners, cognitive dysfunction. We looked at their cognitive scores and, and uh, we took pictures of their dentition. And we had people blindly rate them on a, on a visual analog score with no knowledge, no clinical knowledge of any of the dogs. And we did find that it was a significant correlation between the severity of periodontal disease and the severity of their cognitive dysfunction. So it could, this might not be cause and effect, but it's uh, suspect, suspicious that, that this could be similar to people that a microbiome um, abnormalities, whether it's teeth or other parts of the gastrointestinal tract, you know, periodontal disease or, or otherwise, might be linked to developing cognitive impairment. So here's a fairly long list of things that you can you can administer to a dog with canine cognitive dysfunction. Seems like a lot of stuff. Um, there's actually some evidence for all of these. Some of it's in people and rodent models again. Some of it's actually dogs um, with dementia. Um, omega-3 uh, fatty acids, MCTs again, uh, some phytochemicals, uh, curcumin, uh, resveratrol, which is find, found in grapes, green tea, catechins, SAMI, um, acetylcylmethionine. Um, uh, some of the drugs, um, uh, you know, seem to have some effect. They do have some, some potentially have some side effects, um, usually not too bad. But um, the question, of course, when you look at this is, will all of these different things fit into one dog? It's a bit of a challenge when you're talking about, well, you know, we've, we've come quite a ways with this disease in dogs and uh, multiple treatment options. But from a practical standpoint, you've diagnosed a dog pretty sure, or you're sure if you've got an MRI to, to blood other things, pretty sure this dog has cognitive dysfunction. Which combination? Are we going to send this pet home with without overwhelming the owner? Um, so we often have to pick and choose with some of these nutraceuticals just because it's too much. So nothing really published in dogs. I've been using this for several years, and I will say anecdotally, levetiracetam does tend to improve their cognition. I haven't done a study on it yet, but it does seem to work it's very well tolerated in general. Sometimes dogs will get a little drowsy with levetiracetam. Medium chain triglycerides or MTCTs, we mentioned a little bit. So um, one of the things I did mention is medium chain triglycerides can be converted very rapidly to ketones. So when you've got a dog with canine cognitive dysfunction, we know that they're 
neuronal glucose utilization is not what it should be, this can be part of the benefit could be that this is used as an alternative energy fuel for the neurons. So um, there's also some recent evidence that there's direct effects, direct positive effects of medium chain triglycerides on brain function. So it's important when you when you think about if you're if you're actually adding medium chain triglycerides as a nutraceutical, something that you're adding separately, not something that's found in a commercial diet, that it should be a combination to get the right combination of MCTs. It should be a combination of coconut and palm oil. Um, there are a lot of products out there that are just straight up coconut oil. Probably not the best blend of MCTs. Um, the best product I've found for MCTs is by a company called Now NOW. There are some combination products out there. They're good. They're good products. There's evidence of efficacy. They're well tolerated. They're primarily conventional Western ingredients. One of them does have ginkgo in it, but that's the only Chinese herbal uh, in these two products. Um, so talking about Chinese herbals, uh, here's a list of some of the more um, proven individual herbs that have shown some efficacy in treating Alzheimer's disease in people or and or treating um, rodent models with uh, Alzheimer's disease. So when you look at these um, mechanism action, for some of you, it's like, well, you do understand what that means. For some of you, um, it's mysterious. These are metaphorical terms um, that are consistent with um, TCVM pathophysiology. So what, what do these things mean? You know, damp and phlegm, clears heat, removes toxins. Well, I mean, toxin sounds kind of like, hey, maybe those bacterial toxins, which probably what it is. Uh, damp and phlegm, especially phlegm, this is stuff that shouldn't belong there. Something, something that accumulates, of course, that could very well be um, beta amyloid. Um, and then, um, it's interesting to see some of these say invigorate blood, um, move blood, because microvascular disease is very common in dogs and people with dementia. Um, so when you look at the sort of translated um, slide, it's a, you know, it's a very busy slide, but um, these are the same herbals in conventional terms, mechanisms of action. And for a lot of these, they've actually pulled out and found the individual chemicals in the plant that have these activities. For example, Huperzia serrata, Huperzine A is the, is the most active ingredient. So if you look at these different actions, you can try to kind of um, see that, that, yeah, this, this probably would be beneficial to a dog with canine cognitive dysfunction. So antioxidants, procholinergic, anti-glutamate, um, you know, inhibiting uh, beta amyloid production and accumulation. Uh, pro, let's see, we've got um, uh, some more that are anti-apoptotic, which is programmed cell death. So this this um, looks like this might be a good option um, to treat uh, CCD with. So there are also some um, purely Chinese herbal formulas used for dogs and, and people. Uh, so note that these are all um, Chinese herbals, no nutraceuticals mixed in with them. So um, the one I've used the most is a Raymania 6 or Liu Weidewang. Um, there's actually evidence in people this helps with uh, Alzheimer's disease. So after going through all these different options, especially all the things you can give orally, um, this sort of dilemma often comes up. Too many treatment options. What do I do? Uh, and this is part of the challenge and part of the impetus for coming up with a combination nutraceutical that got multiple ingredients in one capsule. Uh, because for years, this was something um, I've had to deal with. There's so many things that might probably, that might would probably provide benefit with some proof behind it, but too many for an owner to really be expected to give, uh, the, you know, all at once. So uh, in general, you want to keep things simple, not to overwhelm the owner, just a few things at a time. Uh, one thing they can start with is diet or diet supplements. There are some drugs you can try, not too many, um, and then adding things um, like nutraceuticals and herbs. And of course, with, with um, the integrative supplement that we've come up with, 
that's done pretty much at the same time with the same product. And then add in other options depending on response and owner compliance motivation. So other options, of course, would be things like um, cognitive uh, you know, enrichment, uh, exercise, uh, maybe trying other things like laser therapy, like pulse electromagnetic field therapy, um, but just sort of add things, um, a few things at a time. So our challenge was, is after treating these dogs for years and having to pick and choose what I'm going to start with because there's just so many options, um, is to develop an integrative supplement for canine cognitive dysfunction. So what's that? What does that mean? That means a combination of what's considered more conventional nutraceuticals in the same supplement as some Chinese herbals with evidence of efficacy from, from the literature. So concept is a combined Chinese herbal and conventional nutraceutical supplement and one capsule. So we went and found the individual ingredients for, for both categories, conventional and Eastern, that seem to have the most evidence of efficacy and the least likelihood of adverse effects. And then we've identified the best resources for these high quality ingredients for our new product. So CognoCaps is an integrative supplement for CCD. It's a combination of Eastern Chinese herbals and Western or conventional nutraceuticals. All ingredients are NASC certified, meaning they, everything's third party tested. And um, this was formulated by, by me. I'm a board certified neurologist. I'm also certified in Chinese herbal therapy. So here's some examples of, of some of the um, more Western uh, conventional and Eastern ingredients and cognicaps. Um, so acetyl methionine, phosphatidylserine, coenzyme Q10, vitamin E. Of course, some of these have actually been shown in dogs um, in other studies, previous studies, to be beneficial in improving cognition. Uh, we, the, top, the top herbals we put in cognitives are Dan Chen, Salvia, Yin Yang Ho, Epimedium, Huang Chin, Scutellaria, and Wan Shi. Um, and down at the bottom left, I've got, you know, because most people know about curcumin. What happens sometimes when something is initially thought of as non-conventional, integrative, um, uh, you know, Eastern, but over years it shows it actually works. It sort of transmogrifies into what's considered conventional. So curcumin um, is a Chinese herb, but it's considered um, effective by, by so many people that it kind of bridges the gap. So there is curcumin in cognacaps, um, but I put it down on the bottom left because I'm not really sure it fits one of these two major categories, it probably fits both of them. So what are the potential benefits of Cognicaps? Well, one of them, of course, already covered is that um, instead of saying, well, you know, I got all these nutraceuticals, like I got four or five nutraceuticals, four or five Chinese herbals I'd like to put the dog on, but, you know, I, I don't think giving eight pills is going to work. Um, it's all in one. So we've got an integrative supplement. It's got multiple different uh, ingredients in one little capsule. That's a best-in-class product. I formulated it. Um, it's there's clear dosing instructions on the bottle. Again, NASC certified, third-party tested, and customer satisfaction is guaranteed. So, how much does this cost? The wholesale price is thirty dollars, and retail is about sixty dollars. And the wholesale wholesale minimum order minimum is uh, five hundred dollars. There's um, a 60-day buyback guarantee for wholesale orders, and Dr. Fossum, Dr. Fossum's pet care will buy back any product you can't sell within 60 days. So there's a and there's a 100% customer satisfaction guarantee. Uh, this slide just shows that the the Dr. Fossum's pet care ambassador program and why you should join, how it works. Um, some of the highlights here are you get to track your sales. Uh, on the on the on your dashboard, um, you can earn up to twenty percent commission on all your referrals, and um, you also get uh, real time support for the person if you, whenever you need it. So, um, 
this is uh, certainly something worth looking into. So in conclusion, um, we've talked about a little bit of pathophysiology of, of CCD in dogs and how it is similar to Alzheimer's disease and also a lot about all the different treatment options. So um, Cognicaps uh, is a product that really was born out of, a little bit out of frustration, um, knowing there's, there's multiple different individual um, you know, non-drug options that show you know, promise for helping dogs with cognitive impairment. And the frustration partly being that, you know, there's not a lot of combination products out there and, and there really weren't any that were uh, a real sort of um, matched combination of, of almost equal conventional versus Chinese herbal. So we are in the midst of conducting an open label, small clinical trial, looking at Cognicaps and their effect on cognitive scoring in elderly dogs. We'll hopefully get that finished fairly soon. Um, but um, if you have any um, questions or comments about this presentation or Cognicaps, just uh, let us know. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Terry Fossum, and it's my sincere pleasure to be here with an old time friend of mine, Dr. Curtis Dewey. Um, Curtis is uh, one of the very best neurologists and neurosurgeons in the country. And we're very excited because Dr. Dewey helped us formulate a product that we're now selling that we think is unique for canine cognitive dysfunction. Uh, so with that introduction, Curtis, it's a pleasure to be able to talk to you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you came about this formula and um, what the study, while preliminary, what it's shown. Oh, thanks, Terry. So the the sort of the um, genesis of this formula was it was initially based on uh, treating a lot of dogs with cognitive impairment. It's um, uh, typically what I would do. Uh, a lot of my colleagues would do the same thing. There there are actually quite a few individual um, nutraceuticals. Uh, which includes herbals that have been shown either in dogs with cognitive dysfunction, rodent Alzheimer models, or or people with Alzheimer's to have a positive effect. So after you know struggling for years, adding multiple things on, um, and which can be very overwhelming to the owners as well, um, I decided on you know coming up with something that would be um, a supplement that had to, had a number of uh, proven effective nutraceuticals in in one supplement, um, which is what Cognicaps is. And so uh, basically went through um, the literature looking for those Chinese herbals and those what are considered more conventional kind of nutraceuticals um, that had the most evidence of efficacy, uh, least evidence of potential toxic side effects. And that's uh, what we came up with 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 Cognicaps. So uh, we have right now mainly anecdotal evidence. We have quite a few dogs taking it. It looks like it's working quite well. Uh, what we're working on now is something more objective. So what we're doing is um, having um, owners fill out a scoring sheet called a DISHA score that gives numbers for certain categories that are characteristic for um, cognitive impairment. Uh, and then at one and two months, we have owners refill out those scores and, and measure the, hopefully measure the improvement. Um, it, it's, um, these things take a little time, a little bit difficult to do, um, but we have, you know, the preliminary evidence looks like it, it's, it's, it's helping quite a bit. Um, not a huge surprise because, you know, the individual components have been shown to be effective in different uh, scenarios, whether they're actually clinical or, or uh, models. and. Um, so the, the next phase, of course, is to try to get enough patients enrolled that we can actually publish the results. But uh, in the interim, we're still looking for patients to enroll. One thing that I've learned uh, 
during this process of, of you know, trying to evaluate the efficacy of this is, is to make sure that clients are, are, are well informed of what we're doing. We don't have the cure for Alzheimer's uh, for, for dogs or, or people. Several um, pet owners who um, put the patient, their dog on Cognicaps um, and then took them off of it and then realized something had regressed. And, and what we've seen regress the most is the, the interruption of the sleep-wake cycle. cycle. Uh, dogs with cognitive impairment, they often will be more irritable at night. They won't sleep. They'll keep their owners up. They'll vocalize. That seems to be um, helped quite a bit so far with Cognicaps. And some of the owners that have removed their dog from the product realize after they're off of it, they're keeping them up at night. So what we're hoping for is that owners understand that controlling this disorder is a stepwise thing. You know, cognitive caps is going to be one part of, of control. There's other things we can we can do. But when we enroll dogs in this, uh, what we we expect is an improvement. Um, we expect it to be a measurable improvement, but we don't expect it to totally resolve. Uh, um, we will certainly move on from there after the study data is completed. You know, the plan would be for those dogs to certainly add things on that might help further improve their cognition. But so, yeah, so basically we're, we're getting, them, getting the numbers together to try to get something more solid so we can publish it and, and get it out to the public. Chris, it's, it's very interesting that um, the thing that people seem to be noticing the most or probably the thing that bothers people the most when they have a dog with canine cognitive dysfunction. And it's what you mentioned in that these dogs are keeping people up at night, waking them up multiple times during the night. And it does seem uh, from what the feedback we've been getting, and I think the feedback you're seeing as well, is that that is something that we seem to be able to improve upon relatively uh, quickly. And uh, I don't want to say easily, but it seems like a lot of dogs are actually benefiting. If Even if nothing else changes, they're sleeping through the night and hence their owners are sleeping through the night, which in and of itself is, you know, amazing. And, you know, obviously changes the quality of life for the owner if not for the pet. But one of the things I wanted to ask you specifically about that we talked about early on is, and I know we don't have data for this yet, um, but whether or not we can actually start these dogs earlier before they're showing some of these really overt clinical signs of canine cognitive dysfunction and maybe delay or even prevent the onset of clinical signs. Any thoughts? on on that or just too early to tell at this point no i i don't think it's too early to consider that um because a lot of the individual components that are in cognicaps have been looked at as supplements um for dogs and and for people just you know as they age to be more preventative and we talked about that and i think we got kind of caught up in the the treatment of obvious ccd but there's, you know, my hope is is that part of, you know, showing this actually makes a difference is this will be become popular as, as a preventative. I mean, it's it's um it's a it's one pill for little dogs, one pill twice a day, uh, and there is there's pretty I mean there's there's more information in people obviously with Alzheimer's, but there's pretty solid evidence in dogs too, was based on some some beagle studies that once they get to be about six years old. Um, they start to lose some cognitive ability. Uh, these are sort of specific testing where they'll see if they can remember where, you know, foods placed under objects and, you know, but uh, something you might not notice at home, but similar to human humans with Alzheimer's, probably the best time to think about, you know, the future about staving off something that might help happen when you're 60, 70, 80 years old, maybe when you're, you know, um, middle aged, is to to think about, hey, maybe uh, maybe is a good time I, I start taking uh, antioxidant, omega three fatty acid, or something instead of waiting. Um, so so yeah, I I think my hope is that people will think of this not just as oh my dog's clearly looks like 
he or she has dementia, now it's time to do something. But think about it when they're, you know, six, seven years old before it happens. Um, the the ingredients of cognacaps, I mean, they're 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 pretty healthy things anyway. I mean, they're the Chinese herbals are all different types of plants uh, with a lot of beneficial health effects. Um, the antioxidant, uh, you know, they're they're in other supplements that dogs, you know, take for other, you know, potential health issues. This this concept of, you know, taking something as a pre preventative in case it happens. Um, as dogs get older, and a lot of our dogs could, you know, their their nutrition's better, their healthcare is better than it used to be. It's real common to see dogs, you know, 14, 15 plus years years of age, especially the small breeds. Um, it's I think it's really something to consider is if you've got something that's likely to happen when your dog gets to that age and it's really likely to happen, it's very likely to happen. You get your dog gets to be over nine years old, it's it gets more likely as they get older that there's going to be some level of cognitive impairment, then why not? Uh, it's something it's often not equated with other sort of similar scenarios. Like, you know, a dog um, like a Labrador, you know, <laughs> might have might have joint disease, probably will, it's very common. Um, is, it, is it a good idea to put on something like omega-3 fatty acids, fish oil based when they're younger? Yeah, it is, get, get a jump on it, you know? Uh, not a lot of downside. You know, Curtis, speaking of uh, Labrador, you can see trying to crawl up on my lap. Um, and he's just a baby. He's just over a year old. But I do have a 11 year old lab as well. And when we first envisioned cognitive caps, we sort of talked about it. You and I did about small dogs. I have been totally blown away by the number of people with large dogs who are interested in this product. Um, does yeah. that surprise you at all? Or because it, it did surprise me. It, it, it did surprise me a little bit because um, we, we don't, it's, we see it more and more, but I think when you put the word out there and say, hey, there's things you can do for cognitive impairment, then people will show an interest. And the number of larger dogs that are now reaching that age, you know, I mean, my impression is it's gone up dramatically. We still see a lot more of the little dogs that get to be 14, 15, 16 years old, but I see a lot of large dogs that have reached that age. And it's not cognitive impairment, the things that happen, they're time-based. So it's not, well, a Great Dane who's seven years old looks older than a Yorkie who's seven. You know, their time is their timeline is contracted. That's just the way it's always been, although it seems to be changing for big dogs. They are living longer. It is time-based. So if they live long enough, these processes will start to affect them. You know, uh, it's, and so, yeah, I, I've been a little surprised. We just uh, recently put a few large dogs on Cognicaps. We have to give them, you know, pretty much two pills twice a day to sort of, or, or more, depending on the size of the dog. But um, I think what's happening is, the lifespan of dogs in general is increasing. So even though they're a smaller percentage, we're seeing a lot more bigger dogs that are getting to that age where they will start to develop cognitive impairment. So those <laughs> might want to consider putting their dogs on Cognicaps if they have a big dog, maybe even a little earlier than you might put a small dog. So for if you're prevention-minded. So yeah. maybe six years of age for a big dog well like i said it's it's time based so i don't think i don't think it it probably doesn't matter you could just pick six years sort of an average because it's not there it's it seems to be only time based like it takes a certain amount of time for those pathologic processes to unfold no matter how do, how average lifespan a dog is you know so that's why you know, you probably don't see a lot of Great Danes or Mastiffs or Irish Wolfhounds that develop kind of dysfunction. They haven't been around enough for those things to happen. The mitochondria fail, they lay down um, beta amyloid. Those are time-based, just time. So, you know, I don't know if it matters 
if you're going to, you don't have a crystal ball, right? How many times have, have owners asked you with a big dog, how long is my dog going to live? I give up. I don't know, you know, but yeah, I would say around six, seven years of age, just in general, probably a good time to start. You know, you may have a little more leeway with a Shih Tzu, but you know, I don't, I would say probably anything that approximates approximates middle age for a dog be a good time to start thinking about, you know, for, for this disorder. I mean, for things like joint disease, obviously, you know, younger, but um, for, for cognitive impairment, I say something that approximates middle age be a good time to start. Great. Any, anything else you can think to fill us in on this great new product that we're really excited about? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it because it's, it's, it's sort of what's happening is kind of what I hope would happen. You know, you always have some bias if you have skin in the game, you know, it's something that I, um, I, I wanted to do for a long time is just come up with something where I wouldn't have to, you know, send a dog home with seven different things because there's literature on seven different things and they have to have a little pill box, whatever. But it's my expectation was, since so many of these things have shown promise as individual treatments, my expectation is it would have a positive effect. Um, so I'm just um, I'm just excited that it actually looks like it's, it's having that effect. You know, Great. you know, whenever Great. whenever you have something that you've you know you know you know because you had a whole company that you've you know, a lot of these great these products you come up with, but it's you put your heart into it, you know, and it's like. Even if even if there's there's prior data, even if it's anecdotal, like this is probably going to work. There's always that pins and needle things. Like I hope this does something, and it looks like it does something, yeah. which I'm yeah. I'm real happy about. But I I do want to make sure that people understand, you know, this is, you know, fighting cognitive dysfunction is a fight. You know, it's a fight, and this is part of the fight. You know, so. Um, for, for me is if you make a dent, like if we do something like we add this supplement and the dogs improved, let's say 20%, 30% or more that that's to me, it's like, okay, uh, I won part of that fight and now let's see what else we get. And there's, there's a lot of stuff coming out, a lot of new stuff and it's not all drugs and nutraceuticals. There's other treatments that we're looking at, um, that, and they might, they might actually be complementary. You know that you you add a supplement and then you add some other treatment that helps, you know, add on to that. But I I I'm pretty optimistic. This is this is going to go well. It's going well. It's going to go. It's going to go well for for a while. So well, we are excited to have worked with you on this, Curtis, and um, can't wait to see what larger studies show. Yeah. So. yeah. Well, I I can't wait either. I'm I'm. You know the the initial the initial approach of you know uh, an open label study to me it does make sense. It's it's very difficult to enroll. The, the more the more um, damaging a, a condition is to quality of life for a pet, you know, the more unlikely a pet owner is going to say, yeah, I I. I I, I think a placebo control study would sounds good where I might get something that we know will do nothing. Um, so this is a, and I don't even know in the future that would make sense. I, it may be something comparative where you can, will eventually compare cognitive caps versus something else where there's, but um, this is a good start. You know, we, open label, does it invite maybe some um, bias, a placebo effect? Yes. Um, but, this is where you start, I think. We start with open label study, see if there's something measurable. If, if yes, then we expand it to something a little bit bigger and maybe something compared to some other treatment. So what you're saying is that this disease is really tough for people to live with. And when they come in to see you to find some sort of treatment, what you're saying is what that they're saying? not typically willing to um, a role in a study where they might or might not get a drug that's going to help them just because they can't live with this. You know, they don't want to live with this for months more. They want help now. And so you, you really need to provide a product 
that is being investigated at least for that. So hence the no placebo in this first study. Yeah, and I think that's that's a common, I mean, it's, it's somewhat opinion-based, you know, uh, it's something that we deal with a lot you know, with other fairly serious diseases, you know, probably the quintessential one is epilepsy in dogs. You know, it's like when you get a, you get to a point where a dog's refractory, you know, it's on several drugs and they're having seizures and, and the quality of life has been affected. And you say, well, from a purist standpoint, uh, I got this new drug or whatever, I should do a placebo controlled study. Um, those are really difficult to get done. They'll take a lot longer and whatever you're thinking of, of getting out there for the for the pet owning public, they will be delayed. Um, very controversial, you know. Is is it is it okay when you know this is uncontrolled, uncontrolled disorder? They're seizuring, or their their cognitive impairment is progressing fairly quickly at this point. Um, does it make sense to do a placebo controlled study? even at the outset of trying to evaluate something, for me, n no, it doesn't. I mean, it, it, it's almost become this sort of dogmatic thing where if you don't do it, it's not real. It's not real, it's not real science. I think I would say even after the open label study, my take on it would be, you know, let's, let's compare Cognicaps to something else that there's some evidence of efficacy and, and see how they, how, the, how it goes. I think that's probably a more rational approach to doing something that's controlled uh, yeah. without yeah. saying, you know, for however many months your dog's going to get something that there's no way it's going to help. Yeah. Enroll in this study, half of you are going to get something that's not going to help. Totally yeah. get it. Good. Um, anything else, Curtis? I'm glad uh, I get to work with, uh, with you and your company. And um, glad we have this this product out there. And yeah. um, I, I, I have a lot of faith in it. I think it's going to help a lot of dogs. Great. Well, we're so. very excited. And thank you for all your hard work in formulating that. And um, thank you for your time today. We appreciate thank it. Thank you.